BJ, Angel, Oscar, thanks for coming on Melbourne Calling. We're going to talk about sex during COVID, but also about the sex industry in Melbourne and your role in it and your opinion of it and where it's going. Um, but let's start off. We're here at Eagle Leather, 80 Hoddle Street, Abbotsford. BJ, you're the owner with Pepper of this Absolutely. joint. Absolutely, and Shane as well, yes. And Shane, yeah. 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 Tell yeah. us a little bit about Eagle Leather. So Eagle Leather's been going for 27 years now. We've always been on Hoddle Street in Abbotsford. It was actually originally started by a school teacher and a former school teacher, um, Brian Muir. And um, Brian kind of saw... Like leather a leather of a, work teacher? Or? No, no, he was actually a school teacher. <laughs> yeah, okay. Was, yeah, so um, he, he saw a little bit of a, a gap in the market for, I guess, for, for gay leather men. Um, for those who don't know what a gay leather man is, it's part of a leather subculture or part of subculture of a lot of gay men um, who, you know, you, you probably might have seen on, on sometimes on the weekend around this area, the behind the back streets of Hoddle Street around the lead, you might see um, men walking around in chaps and, and so forth and looking like kind of Marlon Brando. I thought it was just me, yeah. No, I saw that. <laughs> no, yeah. no, but he, he started and, he, and what he wanted to do was he wanted to create uh, a bit of like a, biz, a business that was also had an educational aspect of it. So he, he brought kind of that teacher aspect um, to what he wanted to do and he wanted to educate the community and grow the community here in Melbourne. Um, and so he... He, this is in 1994, um, and one of the things that he introduced was actually classes on, on BDSM and, and bondage and things like that. Now today, we're, we're living in a probably a bit more of a sex-positive world, but back then, you know, you'd, you'd talk about doing a workshop very brave. on bondage. Yeah. 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 It would have been a big move then. A lot yeah. of people would, would laugh or people wouldn't take it seriously. Mm. But um, yeah, he was doing that back in the 90s. And so to cool. give you a bit of a background as well, you know, I was working at an adult shop and not more of a regular kind of adult shop, I yeah, guess, yeah. back then, back in the 90s. And I used to get this, the newsletters and they used to be like these black and white kind of zine kind of oh, yeah, like that's cool. pieces of paper. Cool. And I used to see these guys that were like, and I was quite young, I was I started in adult shops at about the, about the age of 19, um, fascinated by sex and sexuality, always have been. And I would see these these leather guys that would be in like these these biker caps. They'd be big and hairy, mm -hmm. and you know they'll talk almost like a bit of a, a brotherhood type yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. they'll talk about like um, you know like tying each other up. They'll talk about handballing, which was basically putting your know, hand up somebody's ass, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and there was this there was this kingship that they had with each other. There was this 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 you know kind of really you know this interesting subculture that fascinated me mm. but um that's cool. yeah so eagle ever was going for all those years and i joined in 2004 really but it's not just leather men that come here is it? no it's every and these days it's it's, it's everybody you know we, we've grown um, we welcome everybody um one of the ways that we've become more welcoming is that we've actually dropped genders from from a lot of our clothing so these days we sell fetish clothing um, we, we, have a, we basically have a philosophy that somebody's gender is their own journey and we don't want to yeah. like, have somebody come into this store and dictate what their journey is or dictate what, what is suitable to them. Yeah. We, we want people yeah. to feel, um, you know, we want people to experience, you know, have great experiences in our clothing and it's not just a So what would you say the percentage is of your clientele? Like it's still mostly gay, but when we do surveys, yeah. it's still people who identify as, as, as so gay male. Mostly. over in Brunswick Street, maybe a couple of cases from here, you've got Lucrecia and Desaad. It's sort yeah. of like, you two are like the Leos in terms of the supermarket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then you've got your Aldis <laughs> and your Club X's and all that. Um, so do you have like, I mean, you have full leather here, like really high end stuff, yes. which you wouldn't get in a mainstream sex shop. No disrespect to the no, 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 to them. No, no disrespect to any anyone in the adult industry, really. Like, you know, we, we've always, I think that we're, we're we, even we're competitors, you know, with a lot of people in the adult industry. We, I've got a, uh, you know, I've got a lot of respect for anyone in the adult industry because there's a lot of things that we deal together generally. We, we, we come up against a lot of things. But mm. yes, we, we are more for the converted. Yeah. Um, we, we import from countries all around the world, Germany, um, England, Netherlands. Um, and France, it's a destination store mainly? Mainly a destination yeah. store. But people also have always known us as the store, um, you know, on Hoddle Street. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we don't like to have it 
really in your face out the front. We it's like more discreet here, isn't it? It is. Yeah. So I, had to buy, I had to buy a whip for a friend um, and I bought it at Le Crescent de Sade and I'm the counsellor in, in Fitzroy yes, and I yes. walked out with this leather fucking whip in my hand and there was like a bank of traffic and I'm sure I bumped into like 100 people that I knew <laughs> and I just thought I should have come to Eagle Leather to buy that, you know, like, so it's a little bit more discreet. But just, just one, one question on, like with COVID, have you, is the percentage of your sales through online sales like rocketed compared to, obviously you couldn't open for a lot of COVID, yeah. lockdowns and stuff. How has COVID affected you? COVID was, was a massive challenge. It, 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 as business owners, you have to show great agility. Um, you have to work twice as hard. Uh, like our online stores definitely picked up, but not having that foot traffic, traffic uh, saw us with a significant drop in, in, in Do revenue. Do you have any staff that could get JobKeeper or anything like that? Or you're, well, this you're... is the problem, yeah. We, 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 some of us are on JobKeeper, but we also had, uh, you know, one of our staff members was from Colombia. Um, and had no. She wouldn't income. have got. She wouldn't got it. Another, 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 um, another one. Of, sorry, another one of our um, employees was from New York as well, and you know it was very, very hard. So we worked out ways for them to still stay employed. Um, what we did was we created a twilight delivery service. So we were delivering people's orders out to them, like they could stay at home. <laughs> oh, we were delivering yeah. the same day. <laughs> we got somebody who lost their job because of COVID as well. So we, we picked somebody who, who lost their employment for, they worked in exhibitions. And they were driving around with a cute little staffy, like this, <laughs> this staffy that would kind of give That's people so like high fives when they would drop oh, up. So it cheered geez. people up. A um, little high five with your kink gear. I love that. Absolutely. <laughs> and we also just put people into different roles and and, and so we, and we, we found ways to still keep the revenue going online and with our delivery services. And we had a little bit of a, a drive through because I was, I was talking to you earlier that the whole front of the store was, we, we were in the middle of a project where we couldn't open the front of our store. So we had people kind of doing a drive through out, out the back, you know, so we had- <laughs> Drive through the, latex, the kind of, Yeah, <laughs> and, and between the storage facility where a lot of our stuff was, it was challenging in, the, in that regard, you know. Um, but we made it, we, 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 know, we did some things to get by. Um, we also so sold hand sanitizer and gave all the profits to Support Act as well, because we saw ourselves, even though we were um, you know, impacted by COVID, mm -hmm. definitely not as much as the venues around us, like yeah, it, it, nightclubs, um, you know, people who were involved in festivals, artists. Mm -hmm. Even so, a lot of people that buy like your stuff, like a lot of them are like sex workers and like, yeah, like stuff like that. And they're like yeah. all so affected. Like, could, and yeah. with no support as yeah, well. You no know, support, sex workers yeah. don't get enough support. And no. they don't get JobKeeper. They don't, yeah. no, and that needs to change. Yeah. Yeah. Or they didn't get JobKeeper. Um, Angel, you're a stripper. Yes. Yeah, so yes, how did COVID impact your industry? I'd imagine all the clubs were shut. And, well, yeah, and then, I mean- Or do you do online work or is it in clubs? Well, yeah, firstly, all the clubs did have to close. It was part of the, you know, lockdown restrictions. Every club had to close, so that includes strip clubs. Um, for me personally, I have always done dancing and I've had a day job as well. So I was endlessly lucky and I had JobKeeper from my day job. So for me, after the clubs closed, I didn't have to do any online work. But I know for a lot of the people that I worked with, they had to go straight onto OnlyFans, all for fans, anything online that could get that revenue for them. Because so many of them, they can't get JobKeeper. They're international students. They are doing survival sex work. They're doing this because they don't have anything else that they can do. So there were so many people that were forced into that online work. And just for people who are listening who don't know what those things are, they're mm -hmm. online um avenues to to watch a stripper basically yeah yeah Pretty they're like much, online yeah. streaming services so it can be anything from like photos it depends what you want to post and do you think the market like went up during covid because people were at home absolutely. and bored oh, absolutely yeah, yeah. Absolutely. definitely so that um, would have helped a little bit i guess just to yeah, yeah. you can definitely. definitely tell like when for a uh, city is in lockdown doesn't matter because it's obviously any country can do it but like um you'll get a lot of like new revenue because like a whole mm -hmm. like a whole city is locked down so like exactly. if like when london you know and all that stuff it like created a lot of revenue for us it just like so when the entire of Melbourne and Australia was like shut down it was like who are, well if they can't go to the strippers and they can't go to the brothels they'll mm -hmm. sign up to like all the only fans yeah. so like it did work but then it definitely dwindled down once like lockdown like it changes once lockdown reopens again yeah 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 it's very hot and cold it's a very hot and cold industry like the clients that couldn't go to the strip clubs that were closed, they still want that entertainment. So there still is that demand. So the work switches to online and the demand also switches to online, which is great. But in saying that, that's the kind of clientele that are really into 
really into going to the strip club, meeting these girls. They have like a family there and they just want to still be involved. So you really lose out on a lot of the walk-ins, people that are just out on a night out and they want to go to the strippers at the end of the night. You're relying on a built-in audience that's already used to, yeah. you know, using your services. And yeah, watching, exactly. Yeah. So, so, so just for those who don't know, so if, if somebody's online on, on, a, on a stripper app or whatever, mm -hmm. or so there, do you, do you as, the, as the worker, do you just have one person watching? I mean, because if you're in a normal strip club, you could have a, a large clientele and yeah. you're getting money potentially from all of them. Mm. But if you're online, is it just one person? Does that mm. decrease your chance of making you money? Yeah. It, yeah, it definitely depends what avenue that you went down. So for those online services, a lot of the strippers that I know went onto it, but it's not just a service for strippers. So it can be strippers that have gone into more full service videos. So full porn videos or solo videos and you could and you can make as much money as you would make at a club. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Not yeah. if you That's have what I was that. Getting at. Yeah. yeah, if you have that um, following basis on your Instagram or your Twitter, then you can potentially make just as much as you could in the club. But for those that had to go straight to OnlyFans as soon as the club's closed, there is no way that you would have made it the definitely, same amount. Yeah, it definitely depends on your social media, like yeah. interactions before doing it. Like if you aren't really big on social media in any way and you started doing this, like who's really going to see it? Exactly. Do, you, it's hard to gain that sort of stuff if you don't already have the mm. following so for example a lot of these strippers have a lot of followers so when like the clubs close uh, some of them would be able to translate that money very easily yeah but some of them maybe not so much because then maybe yeah. they weren't so big on socials yeah. and stuff like yeah, that but those those streaming sites are like everyone like you have a for what, example, they, what cut do they take out by the way um, I think it's like 10 10 percent on only fans, fans, but it differs between all yeah. of them. But that's usually an average. So Oscar, you're, you're a trans person. Yeah, you're a, a sex trans worker. Man, yeah. So can you, yeah, just talk a little bit what 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 role you play in the sex industry? What's your um, area? Okay. So I started um, doing this because I wanted to sort of expand my brand and. I guess the platform that trans men have in Australia in general mm -hmm. from just doing like modeling or being like more like visible in more ways than one. Um, it's been like the most empowering experience that I've ever done. And I've opened so many people's eyes in the queer world and the mainstream world doing this. Um, and I think it's so important for me to like just keep pushing boundaries, keep making like spaces for me that like not just me, but like trans people deserve. But like mm -hmm. there's really no one else in Australia trying to do this at the same level that I'm doing. I'm not saying there aren't other trans men doing this, but I find that like there isn't anyone in the US and the UK. There is so many guys and mm. like trans women are very seen in the sex world and really fetishized for so many years. And um, I feel like everyone there's a really big stigma with trans people doing it. And maybe that's why they so don't just, want to. So like for Bogans like me, let's just Sorry. just to dumb this down. So you were born biologically a woman? Yeah, yeah. So um, and, I um, and was you... a assigned female at birth. Yep. Um, and then I transitioned when I was 19. Um, and Angel and I have been together ever since. It's been so helpful <laughs> with my entire transition. Um, also, it has been like a opening door to me starting the sex industry because they've been dancing our entire relationship. Mm -hmm. So I felt very comfortable doing all this. Um, but I do online, mainly online services as just a man, but then a trans man as well. There is no like spaces in person to do this sort of work. There aren't brothels, there aren't strip clubs. Mm. It, it's either escorting or online. There's no like, there's not really any other platforms to so do So do you that. do any escorting or is it yeah, all I online? Yeah, I do escorting. Was as that well, impacted yeah. by COVID? Oh, definitely, yeah. Because like, it's just really unsafe and I feel really a bit reckless to do certain things sometimes, um, yeah, mm. but money sometimes you need money so yeah. so, so, so with the end of lockdown <laughs> yeah i mean a mate of mine runs a big brothel down the south collingwood here and mm. she just said that there's just tremendous increase in demand yeah when locked yeah. every time locked a lockdown ended mm. she yeah. literally had queues of me she runs a straight um, yeah. brothel here in, in collingwood she had queues of people out the door almost mm. you know yeah. i mean have you found that too like, um yeah i definitely found that like once lockdown finished like it was like endless people were wanting things yeah, but there also was a lot of demand in lockdown where people didn't really care um, um, so yeah. the, I'm not, the demand for me did not really change that much, but like I said, I am the only trans man really doing this at this level. So there is another, like the sites that I advertise my escorting on, <clears throat> I haven't seen many other trans guys on there. There's one guy mm. in Sydney that I've seen and that's it. So like, I'm the only one. Yeah, so the so demand, demand is, is constant. constant for me, which I'm very privileged to have, but I would love to see like the platform for trans men grow. Like I'm not wanting this to all stay for me. I'm like, there's enough money. Don't to you want go a monopoly? Like, <laughs> I'm, there's enough money to go around. I'm not doing this for, purely for like 
yes, I am doing it to benefit me, but I'm doing it to like so it's almost benefit like a, a, everyone. I want it to, to be visible. Like being visible is more than anyone I could ever make. Like doing yeah. what I do for other people and seeing this and the things I've heard from other trans men and things is like so much more beneficial than any of the money I make. So like the more trans men that want to like get up on this platform and do this, I like just help them. Like yeah. I'm helping a few guys at the moment start out, but like I would love to see them get to the level that I have. Why do you think so it's so quickly. rare? Why, why do you think? Mm, trans men in Australia are very reclusive and they don't really, there's not many yeah. spaces that we, even queer spaces that we feel safe in. Um, so like we're not even seen in like nightclubs. We're not seen in queer like photo shoots. We're not seen in on the stage. We're not seen. So like that's mm. what I mean by expanding my brand. I already do like modeling and um, some performing and stuff like that. But now that I've done this, I've turned into almost like a personality. In the queer world, doing porn opens up so many doors. Yeah. In the straight world, it closes a lot. But in the like queer world, you're like, that's come so with personality. True. I've got so many more gigs now. I've got so many more performances, so many more modeling stuff. And like, so is there much of a porn industry based here in Australia? For like trans people? Yeah. Uh, no. No. Um, there are a lot of people that do it, but it's like, like for example, me trying to find people to film with, like no one wants to be on camera. It's like doing it this publicly is a lot. Mm -hmm. You're really like, yeah, it's a lot. You get a lot of, as much as it's positive, the backlash I get is like tremendous mm -hmm. because still, I am still trans. Yeah. So it's, it's a terrible. lot like very, it's harsh sometimes. Mm -hmm. But so is life. So like, it's not really different to like life that I live. It's just like mm -hmm. a lot more constant, I guess. <laughs> so COVID would have given you a chance to kind of build on that platform, I yeah, guess a little bit did. as well, I, like I social I media wise. This, I started doing this in September last year. So um, yeah. yeah, like sort of the end of COVID. It's grown so much. Grown so much, like so. so, much, so I've quick. gained like thirty thousand followers on Twitter in like less than six months, and like Crazy yeah, it's well. it's been amazingly great, but very overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, like I said, I feel like it's been very overwhelming because I am the only one. I didn't realize until I started doing it that I was like, oh, it's the demand is there <laughs> and needed. So that's why I find it weird that I am the only one because mm. the demand's there, guys. You can get out and make some money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just want to talk to you, get three about the journey from where you started and how you got in the industry. So maybe with you, BJ, I mean, you're at school, you, whatever, what did you, I mean, what was your first job after after you left school? I mean, how did you end up? I mean, this is quite a niche market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you're, it seems like you're living the dream, you know, like yeah. you and Pepper and, and what's his name, the other, the, Shane, Shane, yeah, Shane yeah, yeah. you're running this amazing place. I mean, how did you end up doing this? So I was actually fascinated by sexuality, you know, Pretty young. We actually used to go to a um, Frankston Primary, and, and across the road from Frankston Primary, primary in the 1980s, there was a gun shop and there was a sex shop. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. And there was these old you know, the 80s locations. and 90s that adult shops used to be like MDF kind of boring. You're from Frankston, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Grew up in Frankston. Um, and Shout out to the Frankston gang. Yes. <laughs> Ten percent off. Anyone here can show. Yeah, <laughs> Anyone from Frankston? That's a big. Yeah. <laughs> there used to be this. Um, I used to walk home from school in the, the you know the old adult shop with the you know boarded in windows. You used to have sal salon doors. You know, like almost like from the Western. Amazing. Western day. Yeah. A lot of adult oh, yeah, shops yeah. used to have them in the eighties. <laughs> And in my mind, uh, my you know childish mind, I thought there was like naked ladies dancing in the adult oh. shop. And I thought, this seems really mysterious. I used to try like a peep show. It's a try and sneak in. Yeah. I used to try and sneak in under the doors all the time and things. I was so fascinated mm. by it and just fascinated about sexuality in general. But um, yeah, like uh, I always had this. I, used to, I, was, I was saying in another interview, I used to kind of um, dumpster dive for porn all the time <laughs> at the recycling depots. Sound, kind of, this is I was like just so similar absolutely to me, fascinated to by it. But then I got really heavily yeah. into sport and things like that, and mm. that subsided. But then um, I was very much into contact sport. Mm. You know, at one point I was playing rugby league, I was doing wrestling yeah. and boxing, all, love a scrum. all yeah. exactly at <laughs> the same time. I liked adrenaline. Yeah. yeah, anything yeah, yeah. to do with adren adrenaline and things like that, and then I started having sex. <laughs> and then from from sex, it was like, I feel like you combined the two. Of absolutely, like, yeah, adrenaline. Yeah. And then I was going. I can remember, you know, when I, in my late teens, I was like going, oh, I just want, I just want to have sex. I want to make it as kinky as possible. What's next? Up the ante. Yeah. Up the ante. Yeah. Up the ante. By um, and I left. I left high school probably, and I left home about seventeen. And I, I remember just not really fitting in in a lot of jobs and, you yeah. know, I didn't, couldn't really find my place. But I, and my dad told me to, to actually find something you enjoy doing and try and make a living out of it. Mm. And I guess that was sex, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he, probably, he probably didn't think that was going to be the that. case. But there was an adult shop that, that, that you know, was um, all of a sudden looking for a position. 
I went in there and I spewed my guts and I was basically saying, I want this job so bad. Yeah. I, yeah. I will work I will work for peanuts. I don't care. I just want my foot in the industry because there, w there were not many jobs that come up in adult shops in general. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I got the job and, and the, this, this was the first person, this is my, my wonderful introduction and it changed my whole perception of the adult industry. The lady that ran this adult shop, um, she would take care of injured wildlife. Cute. And so quite often we would have like baby kangaroos at the back of the adult oh, shop, so um, you know, wombats and things like that and possums. Mm. And she would be, you know, she lived, you know, way out in the bush. Mm. She'd be on call 24 seven looking after these wildlife That's drive, nice. drive about two hours into work. Awesome. And, you know, and she would also had a philosophy back then we had VHS cassettes. Yeah. And so the whole back of the shop was filled with cassettes. And every single one of them had ACT duplicators license numbers on them. So her philosophy was whatever we sell when it comes to porn, it needs to not be pirated, which a lot of adult shops were, 90% of adult shops were pirating yeah, yeah. Vi videos uh, back then. Okay. She was like, the producers need to pay, the directors need to be paid, the, act, yeah. the, the actors and actresses, they all need to be paid. Yeah. Um, even though that's our so videos good for cost like the more. That's time, to be honest. As that's well. right. Yeah, and that's so good. Is, and yeah. you know, um, so that was my introduction, and it, and it completely blew apart the stereotype of That's such a good of, of person to have introduced you to. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And, you know, she, and she, was, she was absolutely lovely. And then my introduction to Eagle Leather was exactly the same. I, before I bought Eagle Leather, I worked for the, the previous owner here, mm. and he was, you know, and a former school teacher. So as soon as I started here, he was like, you know, do you want to study this? If you want to work oh. and go to university, you want to do this, I'll pay for it. Cute. You know, and you know, Amazing. so he was always putting me on course business courses and things like yeah. that. I find the kink so. world is so like people that aren't in the kink world don't really realize it's so wholesome. It's such, it's so it's it's such a supportive, yeah. wholesome yeah. community, and like it's not what people think. <laughs> it's not what people think at all. Yeah, a, that's the one thing you learn. You know, it's been 20, 20 odd years now in the adult industry. Yeah. You definitely realise that, that that there's a world that a lot of people perceive, mm. um, and then there's a reality. The reality, you know, yeah. the, the absolute yeah. reality is completely so different. different yeah. You know, we, we a lot of us in the adult industry all band together. Mm. You know, we do a lot of good things, mm. um, and you know, it's. I mean, you've had two good bosses there, but absolutely. also your passion is yeah. crucial yeah. as well. Your own personal passion I am, for. I'm, 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 yeah, look, I, I mean, that I, just emanates from you listening I, to you. I you know? am all about the adult industry. I want to see. I want to. You know, basically, I see my my role, and and a lot of uh, people who work here see our role as ambassadors. So we need to set a good example, um, and yeah. you know, we want to see the end of financial discrimination um, for the adult, adult industry in, in our lifetimes. We'd love to see that. Um, we would also love to to see that general government be more accepting of of adult the adult industry mm. as real jobs, yeah. real yeah. careers. Um, no matter w what part of the industry you're in, like, mm. you know, there's a dialogue where we, where people say that I remember there was like a pro um, kind of sex work dialogue that was going on. Like, you know, it, it, it's a job. Job's a job. You know, some people don't some people pick to be a taxi driver, you know, yeah. but it's a, it's a career. I think we need to go further beyond that dialogue. Yeah. You know, sex work can be a career. Yeah. You know what I mean? It can be. Yeah. It can yeah. absolutely if be. We wouldn't be here and if the demand wasn't there. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and not only that, you yeah. can make, you, if, you, if you're really smart and you do it right, yeah. you can make it, make a I know a, a lot good of people have made amazing careers out of this and probably yeah. won't ever have to do anything else. And that's again. it. And it's yeah. not, and it doesn't, you know, it, it's, there's nothing wrong There's nothing wrong with, wrong with that. that. That's so empowering. And we need ambassadors. We need we need people to fly the flag for sex workers and adult industry. We need to, you know, it's why we do a lot of work i think i've spoken to you before about you know we sent we we raised money for um you know sending money to uganda for mm. section minorities uganda oh, um, so russian cool. russian lgbt network we've worked mm. with before in the past with sending money to chechnya for people who have been persecuted mm. we want to set good examples and and this is this is basically you know our dreams is to to see a bit more of a shift in the adult industry and better mm. greater acceptance yeah and we want to we want to play some part in that of course you know, it's not all us. It's it's everybody else yeah. that, that are doing it, doing it, you know. Yeah. The That's going to be a real eye opener to a lot of people. Like yeah. you know, they'll have this preconceived idea that it's just like a ruthless, they do. you know, yeah. industry, and it's clearly not. At least here in Melbourne, yeah. Yeah. Um, Angel, like. When you were at school, did you want to be a stripper? I mean, how did it work? You know, like, <laughs> I, I mean, absolutely. how did you end up? Not. Yeah. I did not know. I, um, as much as I'm still quite young, there's such a difference between when I was in school and how people viewed strippers to now kids in school mm. and how they view strippers. It is mm. a trend now 
to be a stripper. It's like a TikTok trend. Kids think it's so, so cool. But when I was in school, no way I did not want to do that. There's yeah. no way. I wanted to be a lawyer, hilarious, um, <laughs> when I was in high school. And the, the first year after I left high school, I became friends with this girl who was a stripper. And I remember one night she was showing us what you have to do on a lap dance. Like, this is what I do, getting fully naked, like putting her pussy right in our faces. And I thought, oh my God, I could never do that. I could never, there's no way, like I could never do that. Um, and then um, when Oscar and I first got together, we moved to Sydney like a month after we got together. And we moved there with $150 and absolutely no plan at all. And we just had to make it. So right. half an hour's rent. Yeah. yeah. Right? Well, I didn't tell Angel until we got that. Anyway. Yeah. I thought we had a lot more money than that, but we did. <laughs> but we made we it work. So you scammed out. her, basically. We needed to you get like... out and sort of like find ourselves. And it was yeah. the best thing we ever did. With 150 and bucks, you had honestly, to find no, yourself. Honestly, no, but we figured, exactly. yeah, well. Had to find some money too. <laughs> um, but I didn't go to stripping straight away after that. I actually got a job at a vet, so mine involves animals too. Um, <laughs> not so cute though. Uh, I worked at a vet and it was an okay job. It was just a kennel hand. I just like cleaned poop and like took care of puppies. It wasn't difficult. Um, and then one day I was taking care of this possum and I had to just take it from one cage to another. And I thought it was dead. I thought this possum was dead. I don't know why they were asking me to do this. And I lifted out of one cage and it started clawing the absolute hell out of my arm and my body was climbing up me. And there was a room full of nurses and I asked for help and everyone just turned around and stared at me and stopped helping. And I was like, I'm being violated by this possum right now. I don't know what to do. <laughs> so I managed to get it off me and I put it in the cage and I just took five minutes in the back room and I was like, I can't do this. I can't do this. I cannot do this. And I had to pay rent the next week. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I like just quit that job. I didn't go back. And it just came to me one day and I thought, oh, hmm. what about stripping? And I was with Oscar at the time and I spoke to him about it. And he was like, well, babe, oh, that's so what, fine. if that's what you want to do, go do it, which was amazing. Like there's not a lot of, as much as it's, you know, not, it shouldn't be congratulated that someone has oh, that no, opinion. Oh, no, don't. Don't congratulate um, me for letting you do what you want to exactly. do. Exactly. You know? <laughs> but it's not something that you come across mm. often. So I was really grateful that he said that and he was like, I want to Especially as your it. partner. Yeah, because exactly. at that time... Because there'd be jealousies yeah. involved, did, potentially. Yeah, yeah. when they yeah. did start, though, it was essential sex work because, like, we yeah. were kind of like, we had no money, we had no, bills to pay. Yeah. So it did start as, like... If I was a dick, it was kind of like, well, what are we doing then? Like, exactly. how are we getting money? What are, you, what are your suggestions? What, yeah. what are you yeah. saying? And so it was like, yeah, well, I didn't really care mm. beyond that. But there was that other layer of like, well, what else are we going to do? Exactly. So, yeah. so how did you get a job when you decided that you were going to do it? Like, did um, you just walk up to a club? or? Well, see, that's the thing. It was when I first started dancing, it was so much easier to get a job at a club. Yeah. So much easier. Now, like, there are so many girls applying. Like, I've been knocked back by so many clubs with, like, the amount of experience that I have. But when I first started, we were in Sydney. I just sent an email to the first club that I that came up when I Googled it, and they said, come in tomorrow. Mm. And looking back on it, it's so funny because I dressed up to the nines. <laughs> I bought new shoes. I like did my makeup perfect. I put my extensions in. I just went there so they could like look at my ID. That was it. That was it. I didn't even start that night, oh. nothing. <laughs> they just went for like yeah, a little I, interview. Yeah. So I was literally there for five minutes and they were like, you have the job coming tomorrow. Um, and yeah, that's just how I started. And was the training involved? Absolutely not. That's the other it's, thing that was You very insane. much learn on the job at a strip club. But... Not, well, not necessarily anymore. That was in Sydney and I don't know if there's a difference between like if Melbourne has changed the way that they introduce people now but in sydney you don't get like a buddy no one shows you anything around the club the manager's just like don't grind on them like a dancer's this much have fun and they'll throw you on the floor there was no training nothing i was terrified i've never been more scared in my life mm. and there was no one taking to... your clothes off in front of total strangers i mean it would have been exactly. freaky like exactly yeah, yeah. like when there was i had to go up on stage in the first hour of me do, like working and i'd never been on stage at a strip club in my life i saw like four girls up before me i had no idea what i was because you hadn't really gone into strip clubs i'd before. never been into yeah. a strip club so the first time you were in a strip club you were actually working as <laughs> yeah. a stripper <laughs> yep. that's amazing 100 yeah. percent. yeah it was mm. terrifying it was absolutely terrifying and like Oscar said, like that was a case of like survival work. I had mm. to do it. And I've always, ever since the start of my career, I've always teetered between survival work and um, side hustle work. 
Um, mm. In between them having like, they've not always worked, like have a day job or work yeah. full time. There have been a lot of periods where like, they have like, they've lost their job or something like this happens and like, they have just been dancing. Yeah. And as soon as it becomes like, this is the only money I can make. And it's it's some, yeah, you, you stress out and it freaks, yeah, yeah. it becomes more As soon as you need the money, you won't make as much money every time, yeah. like mm. clockwork. So, so if you worked in a brothel, if, if person X worked in a brothel, mm. you know, it's like a women dominated, like in a straight brothel, we'll just say yeah, straight. Yeah. So it's a, like there'll be like maybe 10 workers there and, and a woman maybe at the front desk mm -hmm. and the clients will be coming in and the male clients will be like a total minority and probably shitting themselves a little bit. Yeah. Where in a strip club, just mm. coming back to your experience, mm. you're surrounded by men. Yeah. Um, is that like, even though that you're not having sex with them, in a sense, do you feel a little bit more violated or like it's a bit more that you're in a men, like it's horny a, men, you're game. surrounded by horny it's, men and you're a, a woman on your own, naked? Like, um, do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely not. The complete opposite okay. is what I yeah, feel it's from a big the game. second. Yeah, from the second that I walked into the club, I was nervous, but more because it's a job and I don't know what I'm doing. I wasn't nervous because there was a room full of men and I was in my underwear. I was almost like, this is my workplace. I own this place and you're a patron to my venue. Yep. I don't give a shit if I'm naked or if I'm in my underwear. I'm in charge and I'm the boss. And yeah. it's like if you... liberating from yeah. growing up in school. Like, you know, like I... When I was in high school, we had a thing called Funny Whack Fridays. Like, the kids do not treat girls with respect in high school. Mm. There's, like, you are constantly just always thinking you're second grade because of how kids were when I grew up. So... You, from, you, were, you were brought up in Queensland. In yeah. Queensland, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, like, that's not a rarity. When I was in high school, I think it's really different now, but there was so many things that were, like... Looking back on it, like sexual harassment, sexual harassment. Like, it was more at school than there was at in a strip school, club. Yeah, and yeah. then going from something like that where you just you you inherently see yourself as second grade, being in a venue where you are the boss. It doesn't matter what the fuck these guys want, what they say, what they do. You're the boss. And you're if like, somebody's a dickhead, you can get them kicked out. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, it's yeah. liberating as all hell. And you're at like the end of the day, star. they can be as much of a dickhead as they want. But as soon as you say like, I don't want to talk to you anymore, they're nice as hell. Yeah, it's yeah. liberating. But yeah, you're almost like a trophy, you're like a superstar. They'll like do anything mm. for you almost. I could be so Like, mean. yeah, there are mean guys that, like, I work in a strip club as like a bussy. There are mean guys, but they will do anything for mm. these women. And so, because, like, it's such an experience. Like, the strip club is like so fun, and they're like, they get so like pumped and right up. They're not, they would, yeah, they're not mean to them at all. They're not. Mm. So, on a good night, Angel, what could you make? Like, you know, it doesn't have to be you personally we're talking about here, but how much could a stripper make on a good night and a weekend in the city? Um, um, it, that is thousands. such a varying number. Okay. Like, I couldn't give an estimate. It depends on who you are, what club you're working at, what night it is, what mood you're in. Do you have regulars? Do you have um, regulars? So, like, my good night is completely different to someone else's good night. Like, for me, I always call myself the lazy stripper. I When I... <laughs> When I go to work, like there's some of the girls that are like, their head is in the game. They know what they're doing. They're like, have, they look like the T1 stripper like that you career. always think of. It's their career and they are like on the ball. They can make like 2K every night. Mm. I don't care that much, but mm. I don't give a shit. So like a good night for me could be like 800 to 1000. Yeah. It's different for every person and what everyone, what everyone's intentions are when they come into the club yeah. and their mm. mood. So, Oscar, with you, you the services that you yeah, provide, yeah. how did you get into that? And um, So, I was actually doing nursing before this. So, I actually worked uh, in a COVID ward for like seven months. And I... What type of nursing? Um, I worked in a psych facility, um, but I'm a nurse assistant. And so, yeah, I worked in... We got COVID pretty early. And so, it turned into a COVID ward. Um, I, before that, was finding it really hard had no sort of queer expression, queer outlet, because nursing is very demanding. It's like endless hours and just exhausted. And I felt like I was using all my time and energy doing, yeah, something that I liked, but not something that gave me enjoyment and passion mm. or drive, where I was also still trying to do like the modeling and stuff on the side and going out and being visible. It was so exhausting. So I decided to take a break and focus on my artistry and like build my platform further. And I was like, I think I want to start doing this because I realized no one else is doing it. And, and I, that was like, well, I don't really think that's okay. And I know so many people in the industry. So I got so much advice and I felt like it was the right thing to do. Um, and 
it was the most empowering thing ever. But it was honestly terrifying. To be completely honest, I didn't even send angel nudes before <laughs> that moment. I literally was so like... So talk us through your first gig. Yeah, I, yeah like- my, I remember... So I have a lot of friends that are photographers and stuff like that. So I did, I did have help. But obviously I did my first sort of stuff just at home with Angel. But it was really hard for me to actually like get out of my head and be like, is this what people want? Is this people want to see? Because I, as like I'm sure people have body issues, but as a trans person, I was like, I don't know. Like, I don't think this is what people want to see. And then I literally was like, but I, from experience of everything else I've done, I've realized that like, I need to get out of my head. And as soon as I have done things that I'm shitting myself to do in the past, I've realized everyone else's reaction is so different to mine and I need mm. to get out of my head and it's all me and so how I view myself. So I actually made Angel make the first post. <laughs> I didn't post it. I was like, here's some photos, post this. That's and <laughs> and I like checked Twitter and I was like, wow. Like it's like it was very, very, very quick to get response. So it, my view on it changed very quickly. I wasn't scared like after like a day because I realized how many people were interested in seeing me like that I guess so it was really like empowering like honestly like a, sw- a flip of a switch within like a day mm-hmm. being like so scared, scared like the it. week leading up to it we did like a photo shoot and I got like so upset and I just freaked out but then like posting it was yeah it was just the best feeling I've ever had to be honest so when you've had sex with people yeah so for- would you mean like people I've made a video with or people like an escorting gig? Well, either one. I mean, my question relates to either one, actually. Is it all an act? Is it like, for example, mm. if I'm working at a posh restaurant doing hospitality, mm. I could be in a real bad mood. I could hate the people that I'm serving yeah. to, and but I have to put on an act. Yeah. Mm. Is um, it the same or do you sometimes get <clears throat> sexual satisfaction oh, yes. yourself or um, is it totally an act, you know? Okay, so when it comes to like um, a collab setting, yeah, you're... I don't know about other people, but I personally wouldn't work with someone that I wouldn't have sex with, Mm. like outside of that video. Like it's porn that I want to make for me. I'm not doing it for anyone else. If it's not benefiting me in multiple ways, I probably wouldn't do it. Like I wouldn't, because there is the aspect of a camera and stuff and you do get in your head. Like if I wasn't attracted to them in any way, it would make it extra weird and uncomfortable. Like I have to be into it to some degree. So I don't film with anyone that I wouldn't, don't feel comfortable with because then there is the aspect of filming which yeah makes you anxious but on um, my first actual scene ever was a professional setting with um the real sick bitch in melbourne and um this videographer named big vin um so my first ever video with anyone else that wasn't just me and myself was with like a really really big people i yeah, was huge. shitting myself i was so scared and I realized as soon as like <clears throat> Vin got there, it was so easy, so comfortable. But I would say those, the more professional it is, the more of an act it is, I would mm-hmm. say. Um, because it is like, think of a modeling like setting. It's a lot of stop, start, changing, move this angle, stuff like that. You do try and make it as natural as possible, but like you do have to like maybe redo things or get that shot again or something. So like you do have fun doing it. I wouldn't say I don't have fun, but I wouldn't say, um, I don't like finish by any means, if that's so, what you mean. So with the porn that you've done, I mean... <laughs> if that's I, what you mean, I don't like finish by any means, no. Yeah, no, fair no. <laughs> But is there like uh, rules that you set in advance? Like, I, Yeah, what, you set the... Like, what do yeah, you want to... It's not necessarily like what... You, yeah, what you're comfortable with. Yeah. yeah, what you're comfortable yeah. with, but also like what sort of scene do you want to film? Like, for example, on Tuesday, I'm filming like a latex leather like bondage scene at like a dominatrix house with like in her dom room. So like, but other times it might just be like more natural, more like whatever. It just depends what you want to do with them and you figure it out before you go and mm. stuff like that. But when it comes to escorting, um, no, I do not enjoy it. It's that's the act. It's all for them. It's all for them. And like, but they know that. They know that, like, if they otherwise they would want. Have me. you ever knocked back your client? Oh, endless, endless. What, before you meet them or when you meet them? Um, I have not got to a setting. I wouldn't go to a setting that I didn't feel comfortable with. Yeah. 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 So um, because it, I, obviously it being you, without as, naming names, obviously, but like, why would you why would you knock back client X rather um, than client Y? And the way that they talk y? to me, that like you, I'm not a product. I'm a person. I am not yours to buy. I, do you know what I mean? Like, yes, you can hire yeah, me, yeah. but I'm not your little toy. You can't be like, I want you now. Now, 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 now. I want this now and like very, dim- no. It is on my terms, me and I am in control and you can't tell me what the fuck to do. Have you ever been in Pretty a scary much. situation? Um, I've been in a situation, a few situations where um, the guys are quite bigger than me and they have like laid like this, like I felt out of force, but 
No, but that's like the most. But I feel like mm. it wasn't like, I don't think their intent was bad. I just, I got freaked out yeah. because I don't know them. But I could see it like it was just like part of like the kink of it. But I was like, I wish that you kind of like told me this before. But I did say, I do say that sort of stuff after. Or if I feel uncomfortable, I'm like not a, like, I'm pretty strong. I'm happy to push back and punch back. I do carry mm. a knife in my bag and I'm not stupid. Yeah. Um, everyone knows where I am. My locations are on. I happily would be like, wait one second, I'm just gonna call someone to let them know where I am so they know that people know where I am. Like, I'm not, mm -hmm. you, yeah, just be safe. Mm. The safer you are and the more aware, if you, like for example, my first booking, I had no idea what I was doing, but I rocked up there like I knew what I was doing. I was confident and because if you rock up to that setting alone, you have no idea what they could do if they realize you've never done this before. You're exactly. scared and you don't know what you're doing. And like, yeah, that's all. And do you have a driver waiting for you at the front? No. Or, or you just have your mobile phone? Yeah, I just and hopefully I you can access just get that. an Uber. Yeah, yeah. Or a train or something. I don't drive, but I probably just get an Uber. No, what I meant more is in terms of like security. Like, oh, no. Yeah. Um, the way that I look at it is like this. Like I was explaining this to this other guy who's starting out and he was saying the same things. Do I need a driver? Like, do I need these things? I said, would you meet up with someone on a dating app tonight? Would you meet up with someone that you chatted to tonight? And That's a said, really good call. And he actually. said yes. Yeah, I see what you mean, he yeah. said yes, and I said, "Would you take a driver to that? Would you do that?" And he said, "No." I said, "Would you hook up with someone that you felt unsafe with?" No. There's so, like just think of that setting. Yeah, yeah. Yes, be safe about it and let people know where you are and be aware and let them know you're fucking aware of it. But it's the same thing. That's it's 2021. If people say that sort of stuff, do hook up with blank profiles on Grinder. Mm. Yeah. endlessly go to places like saunas where they meet like random people like you don't know like it's just the same setting but with cash involved that's mm. it it's not and to be honest when you're an escort and someone does want to book you you are like an angel they treat you like mm -hmm. i've never felt un really unsafe they literally like oh, of course anything do you want anything else is are you feeling comfortable like they don't want you to be feel weird because they want you to come back they want mm -hmm. yeah BJ, um, I think I know the answer to this question, but like, would you be just as happy selling books? I mean, as distinct from what you're doing here, it seems to me that this is, there's almost like a quasi-political agenda yeah, not with a small no. P, not a capital P. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Just like, what is your goal here? Um, so Over and above making money and surviving, yeah, obviously absolutely. paying the rent. So we kind of set some of our targets to not, to be more sentimental. Um, I, I believe that if you set all your business goals just around money, mm. um, you, you get used to money. <laughs> you know, money's good because I, I mean, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to inherit property or anything. My, both yeah. my parents are pensioners now, don't have pro property coming, so I'd love to get a house. You know, that's what I'd love to pay off a house one day. Mm. Um, However, like, you know, we've got a lot of other goals. Like one of our goals is we want to see, be a part of making um, Melbourne like the Berlin of the Southern Hemisphere. I love that. That's, that's yeah, what we would love to do. do. That. So, Say so that again, the, bird, we would, the Berlin. We would, love, we would love to see Melbourne like the Berlin of the Southern Hemisphere. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But by yeah. 2030, so, we, so we've all set this goal. And so we, we put a lot of, we, we run um, fetish techno events. Um, we bring over overseas um, international DJs for those and international performers. Um, if somebody's running an event, we pump money into it or we, we sponsor it or we, or we promote it. Like we've got a pretty big mailing list. So we see ourselves as like almost like a, um, got a rare like marketing channels that we've been around for 27 years. So we, we've got the base there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So whereas some people, they might have really great ideas for an event or something like that, but they don't have any way to market yeah, that. Yeah, you guys so are so established, it's really beneficial. That's yeah. right. So we go, we can help them if they've got if if they've got the community growth in mind mm -hmm. and, and they're doing something which is progressive, um, and, and you know, benefiting yeah. benefiting the Melbourne community, then we we will help with that, and we yeah, want to so keep cool. doing that. I mean, mm. we recently lost Club Eighty, yeah, um, which was which was very very sad yeah. for us. Um, but we would like to see hopefully some protection for, for a lot of um, venues in Melbourne mm. and we would yeah. like to see that happen. Um, but look, I wouldn't be happy selling books. <laughs> no, no way. Um, no passion. You know, I, I worked for a little bit outside the adult industry. I worked for, um, I, I remember I worked for social services in, in, in Camden in, in, in London mm. um, and I was kind of in the middle of talking to somebody and I go, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, I, I that That's voice almost going, like what I felt what like I in doing? nursing. Like as much as I liked it as a career, I literally was like, like the same thing, like when it comes to money and stuff, like, yeah, I'm making money and stuff. But like I said, money is not important. It's what, I, it's what this is doing is way more important to me than the money. And I realized that like, I'm working my ass off and I'm sad. Yeah, I'm yeah, making yeah. money, but I'm sad. Yeah. I'm helping people, but I'm sad. 
I'm not helping people the way they want. I'm not helping my community and I'm not doing anything beneficial. I'm just like doing, yeah. Just well, that was, the, that was the thing. I moved, I remember moving to London and going, oh, great. I don't think I'll ever, because I was over there for the fetish scene and, yeah. and yeah. the clubs and things cool, like yeah. that. And I thought, all right, I'll just, I'll leave the, you know, leave what I'm just doing and I'll, and I'll, you know, get by because I really want to be there for, for mm. that. And then after about, you know, about a year, I was like going, no, I'll get back to Melbourne. It takes too I'm, much I'm not going to, you know, I thought when I went over there, I'll, I'll live in Europe forever. Yeah. And no. then I'm like, no, I'm going to go home. I'm going to do the best that I can do in the city. And, and then yeah. hopefully we can build something in Melbourne. You can bring Melbourne. up what you and had there, here. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. So that's why when we put on an event, it's like, let's bring a piece of, like if you go to Berlin or, or, or London, yeah. You can you can't be there with your mates. You can go there, experience really good performances and mm. DJs, and go to these great clubs. Mm. But you can't be with your mates when you when you're doing that. So yeah. we try and bring that together. Exactly. And with Club Eighty as well, in particular, you know that was a, a venue that was um, for forty years. It was mm. just a strictly male identifying venue, right? Yeah. So we managed to talk in talk the the venue owner into making it all genders and all sexualities cool. that cool. was a, that was our thing yeah. um and the, the very last one we got all four levels really? so we had 700 people on all wow, four levels that's so cool and for that's me so that is that sentimental yeah. goal you know see, that was I, more I that probably was that. more to you than like the money yeah exactly I'll never forget exactly it. Yeah. i'll never forget it. like i made a, such a big change in such a drastic world and like it is and that's like that's how i view what i'm doing do you know it's like yeah. such Absolutely. a change it's so beneficial but yeah. gender gender is a very important part for yeah. us as well like because i'm because you know, there, there used to be very kink. much like there used to be like in you know going back you know a few years back there was you go to like a lot of parties and there'd be like a lot of uh, kind of gay men on one side of the mm. dance floor and then we, we were because we were trying to make it more mixed and then there'll be a pansexual community on the other side yeah but they weren't really mixing at first so but that's like, why but we're like going, kink it does, it doesn't have a gender or like a, it a sexuality it like that's why i find the kink fluid, world and yeah. the queer world are very entwined like a lot of the straight men that i know in the kink world are like the sweetest the nicest guys yeah. i've ever met ever and like the queer world and the kink world is so interlined it's changing yeah. now you know what i mean it's and so that's, good, that's really why we thought let's bring international fun acts yeah so people ex experience these great experiences together yeah. mm. and then you know as fantastic grew we saw this better mix you know we remember going upstairs into the sling rooms and you know <laughs> there might be you know a, a a girl that that brought her um boyfriend that might be bisexual you know in two rooms in a row we saw you know uh, like a, a girl fucking a guy in that it was strap on uh, in the in the <laughs> sling rooms why 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 the boyfriend was sucking somebody off you know? <laughs> and then i went oh, this I is great this is exactly what i want more, more yeah. bisexuality more fluid sexuality yeah. this yeah. is what yeah. i want to see with this you know a night where where gender and sexuality kind of all becomes yeah. fluid and, and yeah. mixes and then i went to the next sling room and exactly the same thing was happening oh on another one and i thought this is this yeah. is mission accomplished it definitely yeah. is progressing more and more in like even in the straight world like everyone wants to be pegged apparently mm. so i feel like in the yeah. queer world True. like when it comes to like sex and those sort of things it's going to be more way more progressive because the straight world's even catching up to like that mm. sort of shit so i feel like we've <laughs> yeah I th yeah i think i th like, i really think it is mm. you know but it's we need really to good. i think we need i think generally what what would be a really good you know i, I see that the next real big battle is is transphobia yeah, yeah. um and yeah. i really believe that we need more voices to stand up against yeah. that Happy to. um yeah, and yeah course. and and we also need like we saw you know years ago with athletes and 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 sporting events yeah. having pride rounds and things like that um you know we've we've um we now need to see athletes and you know, um, like actually stand up against transphobia yeah, we mm. do, yeah. and, and, and trans based violence and yeah. things yeah. And, and discrimination, really you know, that that's because that's really getting to, I think that if we're in our own progressive bubble, mm. you know, Absolutely. we talk yeah, our own I mean, dialogue, but absolutely. somebody, we need people it's it's not us that always are attacking each other you know no, what I mean? in, under the lgbtqi umbrella yeah. we need people outside yeah. to stand up yeah for, for like there's people. only so much yelling that we can do because it's only reaching so many people exactly yeah. it's only like reaching your bubble of things like so it, it is pretty frustrating i do find in the porn industry a, a bit of transphobia but i felt like because of how progressive the world is no one wants to say things that mm. they might have said. How does that reflect itself? I mean, how do you pick that up? What do you, um, what, what do you I sense? I find that I have a really hard time finding men to work with. I have a really hard time finding men to work with. And that's weird to me. But I've been in a relationship for like my entire transition. So it's, this is also new to me. Like I never like dated or was on like, you know, trying to like do those apps and stuff like that. Like I wasn't, do you know what I mean? Like, so I didn't experience this like, like my other trans brothers have, where like you are, 
literally either like I love you or I hate you. There is no in between when it comes to trans people. We are like goddesses and beautiful, like the people that book me, or there's the people that will literally just like pick me apart and make fun of me and make me feel like shit. Mm. There is no, no in, between. in between. And it's like, I might ask a guy like, oh, do you want to film or something? And he's like, oh, you know, I've never done that before. And I don't know if I, oh, and I'm like, oh, so like you're grossed out by pussies. Okay, um, yeah. you didn't have to say that to me. You could have just said like, I don't know, I don't know anything else, anything mm. else. But like, it's just that I find that like men are like disgusted by the fact that like I have a pussy and I'm like, okay. Um, mm. Yeah, it's just really like misogynistic. So is that the same? Is and it, like it's it, really fellow-centric, the, yeah, really yeah. fellow-centric. The yeah. but, but if somebody <laughs> is not attracted to a pussy, yeah. is that the same as discriminating and saying, I want to bash somebody because they're a trans person? No, it's like, you may, like they're making me feel disgusting about it. It's not the like, oh, okay, hey, okay, I'm okay, not, okay, you know, okay, like yeah, I'm yeah. not, like for example, if you were into something sexually that I'm not into, I have the right to say, hey, I'm not into that. Yeah, it doesn't mean that right? you're going to put me down. They could literally say, though. hey, yeah. I'm not into yeah. filming like that. I would have been like, Cool, great, that's now fine, what do whatever you mm -hmm. want. But yeah, yeah. like to yeah. That it's it's discriminat like discriminating yeah. me by making me feel like it's yeah, my genitals, that's the reason you yeah. don't want to fuck me. Because I know that I'm an attractive guy, so like I find it weird that mm. yeah. And I think yeah. also <laughs> that element where like when you go to approach people to film, all you're saying is like Hey, do you want to shoot a scene? I didn't and say then what that's, scene. Exactly. That's yeah. the thing that they bounce back with like, oh like I don't know, like it's, With that, where they're talking mm. about genital preference, which cool, you want to talk about that, but like no one said what we were doing in the like, scene. That's your, yeah, and for that's, example. that's where the line becomes like that is transphobia because you're instantly thinking about like your disgust for someone's like genitals yeah. when like that's not even what was really like, said. I could, I that's could do your a, instant thought. Yeah, like I could do a whole scene where we're like a full latex gear where no one's actually, it's not actually sexual at all. I could yeah. do a photo shoot, I could just give a blowjob, I could do a foot scene, I could do, do you know, like anything for so for them to like literally just put it out there because I've like a pussy they wouldn't even take mm. a fucking yeah, photo yeah, they wouldn't even take a yeah. photo with me I'm like okay wasn't even talking about the pussy yeah, yeah. I wasn't yeah, yeah. <laughs> this area has increased to become the center for the LGBTI community mm -hmm. like Yarra where we are it's five times Absolutely. the number of same-sex marriages in Yarra than anywhere else in Victoria and really? we've got like just around here got the Peel Circuit Molly's DT's mm -hmm. Laird um, the um, Ponder Thursday this place um, but something I've always wondered there's no lesbian Bars. Do you think there's a reason for that? It used to be the glass house many okay. years, but that's been gone for so many years, yeah. you know. Mm. Um, I found that before transitioning. There isn't as many, like, there's even in Brisbane or Sydney, there's not, yeah. Yeah. like, there's gay, there's not lesbian spaces. Yeah. There might be, like, one month, once a month thing or something like that, but that's, there's no, like, venues like that, no. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So you two are a couple. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, like, I work in the construction industry, so mm -hmm. if I was a chippy and my partner was a chippy, I mean, the last thing I'd want to do when I get home is to hang a door. Yeah. So, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, so, Look, I definitely how does your I sex do. life get impacted um, by that? I know you're not like fucking men, like you're or anyone. You're like stripper, mm. and you are. Oh, but, I do definitely I mean, do some escorting. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah. fair enough. Um, but how does that? Does it like how does that all work? If you I mean, mind? like, it definitely hasn't affected anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not <laughs> no, it's satisfying. It's not. It's not someone that you want to have sex with. Yeah. And as much as it's like as work. much as that's what you're doing, it's I, I know the answer to the question, but it's for the people out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Like, the way I view it, like honestly, I don't want anything more after a booking than yeah, to come home to Angel exactly. and to be with them because I literally, it's just like work. I'm just like, mm. just want to reverse it. I hope like, none of my yeah. clients are going to watch this anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's, <laughs> sorry, it, sorry, John. <laughs> we work very well. Um, we're very open and communicative with each other. Like, there's, there's never any pressures for us to either have sex if we didn't want to. If we went a while where, like, for example, if I was working a lot and like I wasn't sexual, Angel wouldn't be like, why aren't you fucking me? What about it's, me? Yeah, it's no, not like that. Like, we, like that. There's so much more to our relationship than like sex, like when it comes to intimacy. So like, mm. it hasn't actually had any issues with us, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's good. That's interesting. Um, if you worked for three years at Macker's mm. and then you got a job as a lawyer, you know, you were studying law or whatever, mm. people wouldn't say, Oh, I know Angel. She was she's the Macker's wor worker. <laughs> yeah. But if you're a stripper for three years, if you're mm. a sex worker for three years, it seems to me that it seems to define them for the rest yeah. of their life. Yeah. And it sort of sometimes it pisses them off. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, because there's more to Angel, more to you, more to you than your work, even though it is a huge part of your life. Do you? How do you deal with that? Or I mean, is that just something that you just can't deal with, or you can't fix? Or I deal with it a hundred percent shamelessly. I like the same with anything that I do, regardless of whether it's like my sex work, just a decision, or just something. I I say 
that's what I'm doing and I'm happy to do it. I have it. no shame. I'm so proud of what I mm. do. And if I, whoever I decide to share that information with, if they have a different opinion on that, that's got nothing to do with me. Yeah. And if someone wants to make an opinion on that, they're clearly uneducated about the industry. And in the kind of world that we're in right now, like they're probably going to get more hate than me for being a stripper. Yeah. Like someone shaming someone for doing sex work. Like, yeah, it used to be so different. Even I've only, I've been doing not only, but I've been doing this for five years. And when I first started, there's no way I would tell the people that I work with in my day job that I was doing it. Mm. And now, now you tell them I do porn. Yeah. I tell them, <laughs> I tell them everything because at the end of the day, like it's, it's definitely becoming more acceptable. Mm. There's a lot of things that people in normal society don't accept, but it, it's the way that it's changed. It definitely gives us, us as sex workers a opportunity to really own what we're doing and be proud of it yeah. because there's such a strong, open community now that will back us. Mm. So, and I what your family and friend, your family say? Do they know what you do? I mean, what do they um, think? <laughs> it's, uh, they know. They do know now. I mean, they've known the whole time. Like, yeah, it's sort of known. more like. Don't say, don't tell. No, the way their family sort of used things. Don't bring it up at Christmas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My I mean, dad said something really cute to me one time and he, um, he, oh, what did he say? It was about you and your G-string. It was, yeah, it was about me and a G-string. I was, you I was telling him that I was a stripper and I was going through a lot mentally at the time and he's like, you could put on a million G-strings and run down the street, sweetie. I don't care what you do, just so long as you're happy, yeah. which was really, oh, really that sweet. Long yeah. It meant a lot, yeah. yeah. But I don't think, they've never... Your family's very much like, you're an adult, it's your life. Yeah. And they don't talk about it, but yeah. they're also like, um, if someone was to say, did you know, they'd be like, and? They've got yeah. your back. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. definitely. I think um, they're also be family. like too scared to say anything. <laughs> yeah. They'd be like, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, my family definitely, mm, um, they, I do think that my family do know um, because it has happened so mm. quickly. But they know you've transitioned. So, oh no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just yeah, mean so, the, I so just mean just the separate, porn. Like, on the transition, yeah. they've got no issue with that, but with um, the work? Yeah, my family is um, like pretty okay with my transition. Yeah. I definitely think there's a, lot of misunderstandings um but no they love me for whatever i want to do and they're fine with that including the work yeah um uh, they don't this doesn't no no, no it's not, i'm not saying right. that i'm just mean like they um i think they know and they have alluded to the fact that they know by there's some things you don't want your mother to know mm. um She's things that like that <laughs> yeah things like that um but they have no that no one has said anything yeah. um i have not been back home to Brisbane since starting this. So I haven't seen like my cousins or my extended family. I haven't got to a barbecue where everyone's gotten drunk. I haven't- You probably so make I don't, loads more money no, than so I No, so I just don't, <laughs> yeah, I know, but I don't really, <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, but yeah. I don't really, I don't know how I'm gonna handle it, but I definitely do think that people know, but mm -hmm. I just don't think anyone's like brought it up yet, but um, yeah. I don't really give a fuck. <laughs> yeah, I think the like it's that, yeah, it's more important like all the things I'm doing for what I want to do it for than my family knowing it. They are the life's so, so short, you know. It's yeah. so it's, like it's I don't care. Life's too short yeah. to worry about I, what other people. Yeah, you know, I also don't think they'll be that shocked. Yeah, true. <laughs> I think in saying that, like from our backgrounds and our family, we are really privileged and really lucky that we can have that experience. Yeah. I think. Definitely. There are like, I absolutely do not speak for every sex worker because there are so many people that face so much backlash and so much bullshit from what they do. And I, yeah. we are also privileged in a sense that we do this non-stealthily. Like we're open about it. Yeah. Like there's no hiding with what we do when there's so many people that are in our position that do have to hide it from their family. Or, or do you have to be secret or um, embarrassed or shamed by the, how yeah. people have made them feel about it. And I'm, yeah, I'm so glad. And that some even trafficked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so, so we have a lot yeah. of privilege I'm also, in Oh. our like outside life in comparison mm. to our sex work. Even in the sex work, like like Angel said, like they did get JobKeeper um, for their day job. Yeah. I didn't get um, any like issues with COVID um, like money wise mm. because I did nursing and then I started doing this where it was such a high demand. So like I, it's good for like, if you're in the position too, when other strippers and sex workers aren't to give back. There are so exactly. many like, like decolonizing sex work in Australia funds. There are so many like, like GoFundMe's for sex workers that don't like have struggles in these times. And like, if you mm. are in like privilege and you can do this and you definitely should give back to those people yeah. because there will be times I'm sure in our life where we won't be that privileged and we won't be that financially stable and there will be highs and lows in this job and mm. I'm sure people will help us out so like you should always there's such a good community like that where like I've 
so many people will give you money and help you out if you like aren't working yeah. or you've fallen sick or something because the government is not mm. so as a community like we actually do have a lot of people's backs and there was a lot of like yeah. GoFundMes and fundraisers and things like that for a lot of things like this so it's pretty good mm. what i've noticed with place like circuit my daughter used to mm. work there and i know the owner really well is that it's it's not like a normal nightclub it's almost like a community yeah, yeah. like even when somebody acts like a dickhead the owners often even at the pill they'll say we're not going to ban them because they could really that could flip mm. their they could yeah. top themselves potentially yeah. we Actually, might yeah, kick them out for six months and it like in a straight nightclub if you fuck up you could get banned yeah. for life yeah. Yeah. but Actually, it's just a, it was really beautiful actually to see that as a straight guy yeah. looking at that um, you know like, i knew this person that got into a bit of a kerfuffle at circuit and was going to get banned um and they one of my friends actually said you banning them from here without any understanding or giving them a second chance is banning them from a whole safe space yeah a whole, community a whole community and a whole setting so give them a second chance if they do anything it's on me and I thought that was really strong because they like my friend didn't even know the person that really did this they just thought that's a bit fucked for you to throw someone out of a place where it was so safe mm. so yeah they're pretty good that's, like that's that. the thing and when you're running a business within this community as well you feel like you'll always survive. You know, if mm. you do good to the by the community and you look they'll after them, you, in, in your heart, you, you honestly want to do good work for them. Mm. They'll support you. Like, yeah. we, like as soon as we open our doors again, you know, everyone's coming back and supporting us. Mm. They're buying local as well, if, even if yeah. it's online. You know, we we feel like we can never fail at anything because yeah, like everyone got wants so much community support. support. Yeah, but it's, it's, so it's the the pro of I guess the government not really helping us out is like we've gained such a mm. community because there was no other help and you kind of like have to have each other's backs I guess mm. yeah BJ with, with your family mm. and your friends who are not working in this industry how do they feel about this I mean it, do your oh, family yeah. still in Frankston yes I know yeah. that they, they, my dad's in St Kilda and my yeah. mum's still in Frankston yeah and how, how are they like really proud of this yeah absolutely got a yeah they, 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 they love what I do love yeah <laughs> they're very open-minded yeah there, there's absolutely and, and all my brothers and sisters I'm one of six and all my brothers and sisters are all the same as well and that's yeah, so absolutely. Cool. Yeah, they're one hundred percent supportive. They, they just cool. want to see me happy, and they've yeah, always, they've I was always been say, that way. My yeah. dad, my parents said the same thing, but I think I just kind of throwing happy. it that's back in their is. face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I've yeah. never, never got one. Never, not once did they ever say. That's so good. Maybe you should do this, or maybe you should yeah. do that. You know, like they're they're proud. And, I'm glad. And they, that's they, so good. Yeah, they're they're really supportive. The angel, the um, I guess being a stripper it's like hospitality on steroids in the sense that you, <laughs> do you know what I mean you have to be yeah. like really up and happy yeah. so like it's I work like, in a construction like a so if I'm in a bad mood or a good mood it doesn't really make any difference as yeah. long as I do my work I keep my job I go home I can yeah. be an absolute arsehole at work or really nice to everybody with you it's not like that oh. it's way worse than Macker's even where mm. you just have to have a stupid smile on your face mm -hmm. so do you find that that's emotionally draining like over and above the physical side of your job like just having to dance like to music all the time Yes, you know yeah, I mean? definitely emotionally draining. Um, that's why the drinks help. Um, <laughs> but I, I've been really fortunate with the club that I've been working at most recently where it creates an environment where I don't mind talking to these people because it's more like a, it's like a big fun gather. It's not like a normal strip club. But um, a lot of the time in those normal strip clubs, you sometimes you can have an amazing night and everyone you talk to just gives you the best vibes and you just end the night feeling like on top of the world and the next night you could go in and every single person that you talk to doesn't even say anything when you say hello mm. so sometimes it can be emotionally draining and sometimes you can feel like the best person that's ever walked this yeah. earth and like your shit doesn't sink it really just depends it also depends on your mood as well like if i've had the worst day and I've got to come into work. I'm not going to create a good energy for anyone yeah. to bounce back the same energy. It really just depends on you, how your day has been, how you feel before you walk into the club. Because mm -hmm. you can go through anything on any shift, but it depends how you perceive it. True. So, so just flowing off of that, like the vast majority of sex workers that, that I know are pro quite progressive politically mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. describe, like say female sex workers describe themselves as feminist yeah. um, and sometimes very, very radical and staunch. Yeah. Um, so how does somebody like that deal with dickhead men like sexist They're pricks? They're so strong. Do you know what I mean? I mean, is that, club, yes. that must be a challenge. Do you know what I mean? Oh, no, you just put them in their place. They are so yeah. strong. There's absolutely I'm, no I'm way. I'm scared of the guys at my club than the women. I'm like, oh, what did you say? And the women's like, don't you dare. And they like, they will literally like push them. And the guys will like not even fight back. These ladies will like push them until the security guards will come. Like, yeah. They are, they are very strong and they won't let anyone tell them what to do. There comes like a, 
as shit it is as it is and sometimes you know if i've been talking to this guy for like ages and he's paid me for like the entire time that i've been with him and he says something really fucking stupid mm. i'm probably just gonna be like that's really fucking stupid don't say that and that's it yeah so sometimes i feel bad because my my personal morals if it wasn't in a strip club setting i would be like that's disgusting why would you say like rip them to shreds but then there's that money that's motivating me to be like oh what off the duck's back Mm. um which to be honest is a rare occasion um most of the time it's some really drunk dude that's disgusting and saying the most disgusting things and like just give it to him give it to him straight. and you get security to kick him out or whatever yeah well yeah. yes and no the whole like security will kick you out no matter what isn't necessarily true okay. like if and you if just they- don't like what someone's if you just personally like what they said is against like your opinion hmm. you can't get get someone kicked out for that like they have to be sort of violent and touching spe- you exactly or something, they have to be yeah. violent touching you spending, something like that if they're spending they probably won't kick them yeah. out as quickly because if they're spending money yeah. they will be like mm, we'll see like yeah. they will be really lenient to people that have money yeah. exactly and i think that just comes down to like yes you can tell them that what they said was stupid because we know it's stupid but at the end of the day you're going to waste so much of your time yeah. going through that getting them kicked out when you can just walk away and try and talk to someone else with, with, with covid there's been like this outbreak of loneliness yeah do you know what i mean people are just like atomized and isolated in their yeah. homes have you found that you're doing like slightly more psych almost like the work of a psychologist like- i definitely oh am. yeah i'm a yeah. naked psychologist 100 <laughs> yeah. percent. i am a naked psychologist i've had Very more much. fuck shit than most a like naked therapists psychologist. Yeah, just, yeah. yeah um <laughs> like people say some real weird things to strippers even before covid like Not they're even- actually my favorite because you can sit there and do absolutely fuck all and they'll book you for two hours to tell you about their life story and you'll just sit there like mm-hmm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice, Craig. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think after COVID, to be honest, for me personally, in my experience, it's been a lot more like hot, fast, quick. Okay. They're like, I just want to get a dance now. But that's just been my personal experience. A lot with the escorting that I've done, a lot of that is more girlfriend experience. Yeah, I find a lot more. I find that when it comes to like emotionally draining or like being a therapist, I like feel both of those very strongly. When it comes to like me doing escorting, it mm. is like I am a an educator. I am they are fascinated by my transness <laughs> before anything. Like they want to know anything and everything. I'm like a teacher, I'm an educator. It's kind of funny actually, some of the things they say. Um, but I'm happy to like let people know, but it's very draining um, to mm. feel like a w- object, like beyond what like I feel like maybe cis sex workers feel because I am trans. So like they, yeah. So it comes, that could be more draining actually than the physical. No, yeah, side. honestly, 100%. so much more draining. The things that they say to me and mm. being like, "Yep, yeah, mm-hmm, that's fine. That's so fine. I can't believe you said that about me in front of me while I'm here, or like talked about my body like that, or something like yeah." And they don't really register what it is. It's it can be a lot. Um, I definitely don't like if I. You must be knackered after it. If I'm after if I'm not if I'm not in the right headspace, I wouldn't. But do mentally it. knackered. Yeah. Mm. If I wouldn't if I I don't think it's the right job unless you need it to survival. I wouldn't do it if you're if having a bad day. Don't do it. Don't yeah. do it. If you're not having a good day and if you don't need to do it, don't don't do it because like it's just not good for you mentally. It's where we've got, we've got such a long way to go, don't we? Yeah. For people to all those questions, you yeah. know, with, with that people are asking, you know. To I'm just so them. grateful that I am mm. so like happy to like educate people and be yeah, like, yeah. I'm, I literally am like, you shouldn't ask someone that. And yeah, this is right. why, yeah, but I will tell you so you don't ask someone else this. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's yeah. BJ, what, what, do you, what would you like to see from government um, in terms of, I mean, the re- you and I met when the mm. state government wanted to put a clear way outside yeah, of Hoddle yeah, Street, yeah. Yeah. which would have destroyed your, well, it, it would definitely would have undermined your business. It would have, we had a big fight, you played a key it, role in, it in winning that. Us. It actually would have destroyed us because um, they, they, I mean, that whole proposal and, and, you know, you were the first person to reach out to me and I'll never forget that um, because like, you know, it was, I'll give you a bit of a backstory yeah, if you've yeah. got a bit of time. There was a government proposal, state government proposal to make the whole of Hoddle Street like a 24-7 um, clear way, um, mm. which sounded good to a lot of people who were, who were stuck in traffic, yeah, but it wasn't no. what it seemed because it was like, you know, the Hoddle Street problem, you know, and it's like, how do you convince people that Hoddle Street's not a problem? Because yeah. everyone's been stuck in traffic. But yeah. what it really was, was a, 
you know, it's a problem during peak hour on one side of the road and on the other part of the afternoon or later on the day, it's a problem oh. on the other side. Mm. But 24 seven, you don't need a clear way yeah, out there. No, right? definitely, yeah, no, like, yeah. every time I've come here, yeah, I've intensity. definitely never seen like traffic, but I definitely don't come in peak times. But like trying yeah. to convince people that, you yeah. know what I mean? Um, yeah. And you know, and the government said, we're doing this and we're gonna, we're gonna do it within the next couple of months. And if Whoa. you're in a commercial lease, you're stuck in commercial leases three years, five yeah, years yeah. at the very least, okay. right? So we couldn't have moved it. We were too committed to this. We wouldn't have been out. We would have lost a lot of customers. Yeah. We would have gone yeah. out of business. We would have gone um, out. And other, other LGBTQI businesses here and other businesses along Hoddle Street as well. Mm. Mm. It was a rare, it was actually a really rare moment um, because like I've now got friends along here. That are, I'm friends of all the businesses around here. We oh, were, okay. they would they would never normally talk to us yeah, because we were like will. the creepy guys, you know? <laughs> Always in leather. That's cute. You guys have been together. We've yeah. got. We, now we're all friends along here. Yeah. I even. I even. Um, you know. I was even. Well, I was even on good terms with the church up the road as well. So <laughs> no, I remember that. Because they were like, "Look, we've like, got to get in with the, the king party." Absolutely. <laughs> but like, that's really funny. You know, together. I was. You know, it was probably my darkest hour because yeah. it was like, yeah. "How are we going to win this?" Because yeah, like, it's, yeah. the government's saying <clears throat> it's this, and you know, we've got a lot of backlash. And, and Stephen, in particular, was the, the first councillor to actually email and say, "I support you." And and mm. spoke out against it because it was a sham. The whole yeah, thing that's was a sham. so good. It was just mm. all about political mm-hmm. game. Yeah. And even though it was unpopular to, to go against it, the truth was it wasn't the right proposal. Yeah, that's really yeah. fucked. But further than that, that was one time when I've actually felt like, you know, I was outside of the adult industry where the government was, you know, um, affecting us. But yeah. I think there's always, as long as I've been in the adult industry, unfortunately, the your enemy is normally the government mm. it, it's normally the you know federal government yeah mm. and it's normally some proposal that's or some bill that's trying to be passed um which discriminates uh, and you know i can remember back in the days of um senator harry dean the tasmanian he was like he was very very conservative you know he wanted to basically he wanted to ban all porn and everything um for Good being luck. viewed and Good he luck. didn't have much of a chance so he said okay we'll ban it if it doesn't have condoms ban if it includes more than one person which is what Banning by proxy, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and he was like, he was almost like the boogeyman of of, of the the adult industry. Okay, um, that's fine. But going forward, there's always it seems every year there's a government proposal that, mm. that impacts the adult industry that or impacts us. Um, just yeah. recently, we had the online safety bill, yeah, which looks that. like it's been passed. Which is, you know, this is this is the incredible. This is what my argument was, right? For people um, such as yourselves during mm. COVID. You built up these social media platforms. And the government you, noticed. You yeah. used agility and you used initiative um, to actually build up platforms to go on OnlyFans. Yeah. So you've got income that doesn't rely you on, rely on you going out to like lots and yeah. lots of johns or, you know, you, going, or yeah, working not, in blocks. It's like safe and it's not, it's not like you work escorting. Home. You work it's from not, home yeah. And you've got this revenue coming mm. in. And, and it's, it's great. It's a great time for the adult nature yeah. to do that. But then this, this bill was basically, you know, forcing... Um, social media platforms. The bill was basically, if you don't remove online uh, adult content within yeah. 24 hours, we're going to give you these massive whopping fines. Yeah. Um, and the government was threat- threatening this against social media platforms, um, search engines as well. Yeah, that's and fine. no social media platform is going to say, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll hire somebody or we'll staff somebody to, to monitor this and take it down in 20, 24 yeah. hours. You will basically set up algorithms to, to pick on any keywords, yeah. which, which can be um, LGBTQI focused. Like mm. we've had, we're knowing from running a business that uses Facebook, we've posted images of two guys kissing, um, fully clothed, and had it brought yeah. down because of adult content when mm. there's no mention of adult content. Yeah. Um, we've That's had, really weird we've been at post banned for, for nudity when someone's been in a full cat, latex catsuit, mm. you know, and so a lot of times, a lot of the algorithms and are like normally geared towards um, yeah, LGBTQI they are, mem- yeah, members. I, I definitely feel a lot of this. So t- yeah. you, you yeah. deplatform people from there. You also deplatform sex workers as yeah, well. Huge. Um, you can't write anything about sex work on any in social media anymore. Otherwise, and like I said, like that's where a lot of people get their revenue from. Absolutely, to OnlyFans is on social networks. And so the like, bill was so broad. If you look at the broad part nine of the online safety bill, was basically and this is federal or Victorian. This bill? is federal. Yeah. This is federal. Um, and it just passed. It only passed about a week ago, unfortunately. Oh um, so, and it's very, very broad, you know, it's yeah. basically adult content, you know. What so, does that mean, so though? And the e-safe- so the e-safety commissioner, um, if they get, if they find something offensive, 
if you don't, they could contact you know us. We don't yeah. take it down in 24 hours. I don't. I'm not. Can't have that looking. You know, monitoring yeah. 24 hours. A lot mm. of other people can't. So I just see that probably Google and you know Bing and yeah. things like that will probably set in algorithms to automatically I ban. Do it, yeah. um, and then you know it, all the hard work that you put in with with putting your brand out there gets yeah. gets mm. gets instantly damaged. Again, it's just conservative politicians. Mm. Um, and it just so happens to coincide. They really rush this through. They rush this through in no time. And it mm. just so happens to coincide with all the allegations they've had made against them, particularly yeah. the Liberal Party. Yeah, I've noticed, you know, yeah. They're, they're, they're all <laughs> yeah. of a sudden on, the, on this thing about... Because the online it's called the Online Safety Bill, right? Mm. Which is sp- supposed to protect from cyberbullying and it's supposed to protect right, people from yeah. sexual oh, okay, yeah, kind sure. of things. But part nine in there is basically anti-porn, anti-anything. Anti, 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 you know, anything, it's, yeah. snuck, it's snuck in there. Mm. But it's really about politicians going... We're doing this great job, you know, trying yeah. to obviously deflect from what they're doing. Don't worry about the rapes in Parliament. Don't worry about the escorts. Just yeah. put it out there. Yeah. Yeah. Treated, we've been all these years, adult industry workers and people in the industry, we're treated like, you know, these seedy perverts. Yeah. But, oh, the Wait, guys, I'm not going to lie. They're the, guys yeah, that, exactly. they're the guys that are booking us. Anyway. Uh, yeah, but so, yeah, I'm <laughs> like, yeah, the guys are the guys but, that are booking but, us. But we've so, taught like, about consent for years, you know. You know, you go to a BDSM or fetish party. Everyone consent is knows huge. about consent. Huge. You go to like a, an ordinary pub or a, it's not, or a nightclub. Right, that's no one the one creepy places. Consent, and know? that's weird. Like I feel like that's put on us as well as a community that it's like a really creepy, like I couldn't go in there, I'm going to get grabbed. I'm like, no, you honestly get grabbed, grabbed more at a normal uh-huh. club than you would at a kink venue. You grab 100%. somebody, you're, you're basically, you know, and you do something without consent, you're mm. in big trouble. You're yeah. in big trouble and you get yeah. like really cancelled socially. Yeah, honestly, totally, yeah. totally. Whereas, yeah. you know, it's completely opposite a lot of other places. Yeah. Angel Oscar, um, if you're like, say, a footy player or something, like, mm. and you, you retire at 35 or whatever, uh-huh. you go into coaching or you go into <laughs> media, if you're lucky enough, sports media, whatever, what's the after story with your work? I mean, you can't do it forever, I, may, well, I mean, maybe you can, you know? Well, it's my, going to be ages, you know? Like, um, well, with my, yeah, I definitely don't. What's your, what do you, what do you, well, what's your I vision 10 years, to, 20 years from now? I'm hoping to build enough of a platform that, like, I don't know, I have some. Uh, I'm not saying I'm anything like Buck Angel, but like let's try and be like a baby version of that. I would love to build like a brand or a platform in many ways, more than one. Um, just be able to start my own business, I guess, and but have the same brand and image, just sort of like change it and evolve it into something mm. more substantial, I guess, is my goals in this. Um, yeah, just making a platform for trans men in any way, to be honest, is my goal i don't know what that that's so elusive but like it could mean anything yeah. i just see where like things are going but you thought about it i've yeah. thought about yeah. endless ideas but there is like so many opportunities for me now that like there are so many avenues that like i'm just waiting to see where the next 10 years take me to be honest no yeah. angel what about you yeah for me i'm doing it as a side hustle right now do you study I, as well or no they work i work full time oh yeah um it's something that i want to help create a foundation for the rest of my life. I'm doing it now because I have the opportunity to do it now because I have the time and I have the energy and I enjoy it. And whatever I can create as a foundation from that, at whatever time that I want to stop doing it, I have so much so much else in my life that I can continue to do as a career. Yeah. But I really want to do this to be able to set myself up to not have to stress in the future. But think- again, in saying that, so much privilege for me to be able to do that i also think it's like beyond like what you could do money wise what this has done for you how you view yourself Mm -hmm. and how you carry yourself yeah how you view yourself and carry yourself and the values you've learned and morals you've learned from this is so much yeah yeah it's invaluable like you can make thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars but the feeling that you get and the self-worth that you get and what you learn from doing the job Mm. is invaluable yeah Sounds like a good way to end this, BJ, Angel, <laughs> Oscar. Thanks so much for coming on Melbourne no Calling. Thank it's you. Really, really thanks awesome. for having us. Yeah, thank you. Highlighting. Thank you. Cheers. All right, see you.